How much time does our world have? History is littered with man's failed attempts for utopia on Earth. Kingdoms crumble and empires evaporate. What is the destiny of man? How can one find personal peace? Can we know the future? Yes, we can. Throughout the scriptures, God has sent messages of hope to help us recognize our place in time and prepare for the future. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents Millennium of Prophecy with Doug Batchelor. Good evening, friends, and welcome to another evening in New York City. My name is John Lomakang, and I'll be your host this evening. Tonight's topic is one that I'm so glad you've taken the time out to be a part of. It is entitled, A Jar of Oil, How to Know That You Are Filled with the Holy Spirit, How to Receive the Power of the Holy Spirit to Live the Christian Life, and How to Know the Counterfeit from the Original. Stick with us tonight. We're going to come from God's Word as we have every evening, and we're excited that the Lord is going to fill us as He has every night through the presence of His Holy Spirit. Tomorrow morning, don't miss the topic of the unsinkable ship. Pastor Doug Batchelor has done some specific research on this topic long before it became a movie. You don't want to miss this topic, the way he ties it in with the Bible. And the question is, are you a part of a ship that's going to go down, or are you on the true unsinkable ship? Friends, join with me tonight as we welcome, once again, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Thank you, friends. Welcome to the Millennium of Prophecy. And for those of us who are studying here in Manhattan, happy Sabbath. Feliz Sabado. Dobre Subota. Pong Sabat. Sabat Fia Fia for my Samoan friends. We're very happy to have each of you here, and we're going to continue studying God's Word together. Now I'll bring Mrs. Bachelor out. Is it time now for questions? Just checking. Have any of you noticed that the hands on the clock have been moving? Have you noticed that? Do you know what that means? Someone's been playing with a clock. That's what it means. <laughs> All right. I think we're ready to go to our questions. Okay. Can you please tell me the significance to numbers in the Bible? For example, three and a half, seven, twelve, forty. Have you noticed that certain numbers are reoccurring in the Bible? And there's a meaning for that. Now, we've learned seven represents a perfect cycle of time. You remember the night I showed you that if you take seven circles, six circles, and put them end to end, that the center equals that of the diameter of each of the six. Seven is a perfect number. It represents a perfect cycle. The number 40 in the Bible, who knows what that represents? A generation. 40 was a generation. Remember the children of Israel, because of their unfaithfulness, that generation could not enter the promised land. They wandered how long? 40 years. 40 years. Christ told the children of Israel in A.D. 30 that because they had not accepted the message, this generation would not pass away before they saw the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple fulfilled, which was 70 A.D., 40 years later. So 40 is a generation. Three and a half, if seven is perfect, three and a half is an interruption of that. Three and a half typically represents a time of apostasy and rejection. Three and a half years, Elijah fled from Jezebel. He was rejected. Jesus preached three and a half years. Did his people accept or reject the message? During the Dark Ages, there's 1,260 years, three and a half prophetic years of apostasy and persecution. The number 10 rep represents, of course, God's will, His law, the Ten Commandments. Uh, you, mo you remember there were 10 coins. One was lost. She found it. She rejoiced. Ten lepers. One came back to thank the Lord. And of the Ten Commandments, there is one in particular that shows which God is the one who sanctifies and recreates us. We've learned about that. And uh, that's the basic number 12. The leadership of the church, 12 tribes and judges in the Old Testament, 12 apostles in the New, it represents leadership, and it's a number for the church. The church is going to live in a city, 12,000 furlongs, 12 foundations, 12 gates, 12 types of fruit on the tree of life 12 times a year. Amen? Amen. Okay. All right. Is standing for the national anthem or the Pledge of Allegiance, worshiping an idol? You know, some churches feel like it's a um, contradiction, a moral dilemma, to love the Lord and then to proclaim the Pledge of Allegiance to a country. 
as long as your citizenship in a country does not cause you to violate a Christian principle, there is no conflict. Because the Bible tells us that we should obey the laws of the land, and that's understanding that the laws of the land that are in harmony with the law of God. Uh, God is very clear that if there's a conflict, we should rather die than be the law of God. But there's no conflict in showing an allegiance and a loyalty to your country as long as it's not uh, forcing you to violate your Christian principles. Many Seventh-day Adventist medical professionals work on Sabbath. Is this kind of healing okay to do on the Sabbath? Well, obviously, we, we uh, shared with you in our last presentation that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has, I think, the most extensive medical work of any Protestant organization. We don't shut down Friday night and let everyone languish in their beds for 24 hours while we're all at church. Uh, obviously, people need love and care. And, uh, uh, you know, Jesus said it's better to do good on the Sabbath days. Did Jesus heal people on the Sabbath day? <laughs> obviously. Now, there should be a balance. Uh, first of all, if you are a Sabbath-keeping Christian, you should try to rotate your schedule so you do not miss every Sabbath mm -hmm. because seven days without church makes one week. Pardon the pun. And so you want to be able to rotate and alternate with a friend so that you do get, you know, your church service in. Uh, Karen is in the medical field when she's working, and when she was invited to work on the Sabbath day, she would not keep those resources. She would donate them to the Lord. Uh, the work you do on the Sabbath day should be non-remutative. Now, some people struggle with that, but that's, that's a my big opinion. Word, and it means you're not getting paid. You're giving it to the Lord. You might be part of an institution that says we're required to give you a paycheck. Well, you're not required to put it in your pocket. You could give it back to the Lord's work in another way. So if we're working on the Sabbath day, it should be because we love our fellow man, not because we're working for income. That's my opinion. And you will be blessed. And God will bless you, yes. You will be blessed. All right. Please explain. Jesus healed people on Sabbath, but he wasn't paid for it, was he? Okay. What happens if you don't forgive a person who has apologized to you? Uh, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18 that he forgives us first freely just like we are. Mm -hmm. Then he expects us to share that forgiveness with others who have offended us. He says if after he's forgiven us we refuse to forget, forgive others, then our forgiveness is canceled. You read that parable in Matthew chapter 18, it says, my heavenly father will not forgive you if you from your hearts do not forgive every man his brother their trespasses. The Lord makes one commentary on the Lord's Prayer. You know, it says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. It's a little different in Luke than it is in Matthew. And the only commentary he makes on the Lord's Prayer in Matthew is, for if you forgive not each one your brother his trespasses, neither will my Father in heaven forgive you. Very important that we learn to love and forgive each other. Now, that doesn't mean that we are always going to forget that someone's offended us. You can forgive a person without forgetting right? You choose not to harp on it. You might say, but I can't forget. Well, that's okay. Martin Luther put it this way. You can't prevent the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from making a nest in your hair, especially me. <laughs> what that means is that you can't prevent the thoughts from coming that, you know, this person hurt me and I remember that, but you can choose not to dwell on those things. Don't let them make a nest in your hair. Say, Lord, I've forgiven them even as you've forgiven me. And one real practical tip is you remember how much God has forgiven you mm -hmm. and it's easier to forgive either other people their offenses. And also when you've forgiven them, you still need to treat them kindly. That's right. You know, even though if they've hurt you, you still need to be Christian and be kind. That's right. Okay. And sometimes it's important to forgive a person even if they don't ask you mm -hmm. because by your remaining bitter, you hurt yourself. That's right. All right. Um, the Bible tells us that during Christ's three and a half years of ministry, he, had, he chose 12 men to be his disciples. Why didn't he include women to be his disciples? I told you we, we deal with the difficult ones too. First of all, let me say for the record that in the Bible it tells us that in Christ there's neither male nor female. Now what that means is that the, the value of men and women, the 
availability of salvation for men and women is completely equal. God is not trying to save men more than women. God is not using men more than women. But the Bible does teach that men and women are different creatures and that we excel in different areas. I could have used an amen right about then. Amen. Thank you very much, dear. <laughs> Uh, you know, we're in a society, forgive me, friends, where people are pushing this unisex agenda that men should be able to do everything women do and women should be able to do everything men do. I respectfully disagree. The Bible Amen. does not teach that. The Bible tells us that his design is that men should be the servant leaders, priests in their families. Now, if a man is not going to love his wife as Christ loves the church, then he should not be trying to exercise dominion over her if he's not going to first love her as Christ loves the church. Amen. The Bible does not give a license for men to be tyrants and despots in their family. But the Bible does establish that the office of men and women is different in the earthly families and in the church family. Let me illustrate. God has women in the Bible who preached. God has women in the Bible who are prophetess. The Bible says that, of course, prophetess, part of that was they taught. Amram and Jochebed, you know who they were? The parents of three extraordinary children, Moses, Miriam, and Aaron. All three of their children were prophets. How'd you like to have that on your wall in your house? But only Moses and Aaron were priests. The women never, ever, ever fulfilled the obligation of priest in the Bible because the priest was a type of Christ who was our high priest and it was a male role. The Bible has a patriarchal society. And Christ, when he chose the 12 apostles, some of their office involved priestly duties. He chose men. But then it says in Luke chapter 8, there were also women disciples who followed him and ministered unto him of their substance. So there were women and men that worked with Christ that were disciples, but only the men were apostles because of the patriarchal establishment in the Bible. What's the difference between apostles and disciples? Well, you've got 12 apostles, but there were 70 disciples. Disciples were followers. The apostles were set aside and, and chosen in a special way, and they ended up fulfilling some of the priestly obligations. Now, tonight we have a very important and a very special lesson. We're dealing with the subject of the Holy Spirit. And because of the importance of this issue, I'd like to invite you to join me once again in a special word of prayer as we launch into our Bible study and open God's Word. Father in heaven, Lord, especially now, as I would dare to venture on holy ground and to teach about the subject of the third person of the Godhead, God the Spirit, I pray that the person of the Spirit will take possession of my mind and heart of each person who is listening and help us to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we've got an amazing fact. How many of you have heard of the Trojan horse? I expect most of us here have. The legend goes that the Greeks tried to conquer the city of Troy. Matter of fact, for 10 years they besieged the city and unsuccessfully attacked, tried to force them, starve them into surrender. Finally, they resorted to a strategy that was very clever. They made as though that they were sailing away from the coast and they left a large hollow wooden horse as a gift on the shore to sort of award and recognize the triumph of the Trojan people. Well, inside the Trojan city, the city of Troy, there was a Greek spy named Sinon. He said to his friends, he said, let's bring this horse inside the city and it will make us invincible. It's our trophy that they could not conquer us. Well, little did they know that inside the hollow horse were five Greek soldiers hidden. And when they brought that gift in, they thought that it was harmless enough, that night, Sinon went and unlocked this secret door. He let out the Greek soldiers who killed the guards at the gate. They opened the gates for the waiting Greek soldiers who came in and sacked and destroyed the city of Troy. From that day to this, the phrase Trojan horse has come to represent a gift that may look good at first, but it's bringing in a very devastating danger. We are going to explore some of the gifts of the Spirit, and there is one gift in particular that is misunderstood. We're going to examine from the Bible, and we may find that it is a Trojan horse in the church of God. Amen? Storical comes from the second book of Kings, chapter 4, and it tells about this widow woman. Evidently, there was a man who was one of the sons of the prophets. He was a minister, training with a self-supporting work for the ministry, he took out a large loan to buy seed and some property to farm his land. 
And then he unexpectedly died. And he left his young wife and two young boys with a staggering debt. Back in Bible times, you could not file chapter 11 or chapter 13 and just say, well, I'm bankrupt and go on your way. Your creditor had the right to take possession of your property, your valuables, and if that was not enough, he could take your children to be slaves for years or indefinitely until the debt was worked off. And it was a very tragic thing. Day by day, this creditor came, knocked on the door, said, I want a payment. And she'd say, well, I don't have any money. He'd say, well, then I'm taking your rugs. And he'd roll up the rugs and march off. And there was nothing anyone could do to stop him. He had that right. A few weeks later, he'd come back and say, I want my money. She said, but I still have no money. He'd take the furniture out of the house. And this merciless creditor was one item after another, clearing things out of the house, and she would hand over her precious articles. Finally, in her desperation, she went to uh, Elijah with a statement. Elisha, rather. Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. Now, keep in mind that the name Elisha in the Bible is very much like the name Jesus. Jesus' name, Yahshua, in Hebrew, means Jehovah is Savior. Elisha's name was El Shua, or Elohim Shua, the Lord is Savior. Very similar name. You know, I love the stories of Elisha. Matter of fact, when I get back to my church, I think I'm going to do a whole series on the, the events and the miracles of Elisha because he's very much like Jesus. Matter of fact, everybody who ever came to Elisha in the Bible, their prayers were answered. So this woman, she comes to Elisha desperate with this problem. And he tells her, what do you have left in your house? First of all, he says, what do you want me to do? I'm not a bank. You know, sometimes we go to the Lord thinking that he's a financier. He says, what do you have? He points her back to the resources that she still has, as small as they might be. Sometimes we forget that we still have something. When Jesus said to the disciples, feed the people, they said, how are we to feed these thousands? He says, well, what do you have? Oh, we've got is five loaves and two fish. He said, utilize what you do have. God promises if we're faithful to utilize the little, he will give us more. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. Well, everything was gone except she had this little jar of oil that they had been guarding. You know, back in Bible times, oil was one of the most precious commodities. And this mother, as the creditor came, she gave the furniture and the rugs and the, maybe even the food, and she kept the oil. They used the oil to light their homes. They used the oil for healing. They used the oil to kindle the fires for their warmth. They used the oil for beautification. They used to anoint the countenance for beauty. The oil was used for their food and baking their bread. She did not want her children to be cold or in the dark or sick or hungry. She wanted them to be beautiful. And so she clung to this little vial of oil was all she had left. And he said, utilize the oil. He told her, go and gather vessels from your neighbors. And he says, not a few. And shut the door and then take that vessel of oil and begin to pour into these empty vessels that you've gathered. Well, she did what she was told and her children just filled the room with vessels from all the neighbors. And she began to pour oil, and it continued to flow from this little vial until it was filling all these different size and shape and color and age vessels. They were all brimming with oil. Finally, she said to your sons, bring me another one. And they said, there's not another left. So the oil ceased. The miracle continued as long as there were empty available vessels. Don't forget that. Then she said to Elisha, what next? And he instructed her, go sell the oil, pay your debt, and you and your sons live on the rest. There was a surplus. Have you noticed when God works miracles, there's often leftovers? The Bible says that our cup will run over. Jesus, when he multiplied the loaves and the fishes, there were 12 baskets of leftovers. You can find throughout the Bible that God is very faithful. He says he'll open us for us the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. There's not room enough. You know why? There's an abundance. God wants to bless his people abundantly with that precious oil. Now let's find out from the Bible what these things symbolize. Question number one. In the Bible, what is symbolized by a vessel and oil? Let's go to the Bible for our answer now. It says, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. People were called vessels in the Bible. The Bible tells us that God says, I am the potter, you are the clay. 
and he fashions us into all different kinds of vessels. Now, don't miss the very important point in this story that this woman, what's a woman represent we've learned in prophecy? This woman brings empty vessels into her home and there she pours the oil into those that are empty and they are filled, all different kinds of vessels. You know, this is God's church. We are to bring empty vessels into our dwelling places and then we share what we do have and God multiplies it. You notice God does not fill full vessels. How many of you would like to be filled with that precious oil that God is offering? We must first empty ourselves if he would fill us. Another thing I want you to notice, he works these miracles for us not in our abundance but in our extremity. He waited until she was out. Then he began to work with her and to perform a miracle. Sometimes God waits until we're at our, our last loaf of bread, our last vial of oil. We've got our, like uh, the widow with Elijah, we've got a little flour, a little oil, and two sticks. And then God works a miracle. Sometimes he makes you wait until you're at the Red Sea and you've got the Egyptians charging down your neck, and then he parts the sea. Amen? You know why? You do not learn faith when God takes care of everything in advance. We need to learn lessons of trust. Some people have written us questions. Oh, I wish I had time for more of your questions. Pastor Doug, if I keep the Sabbath truth, I might lose my job. What am I to do? You do God's will and then let him work a miracle. Amen. So many people think, well, I'll keep the Sabbath truth after God works the miracle. No, no, that's not how God operates. You step out in faith and then he parts the sea. You know, the children of Israel, when they first came out of slavery, he parted the sea and they crossed over because they were faithless. After 40 years in the wilderness, when they had to cross the Jordan, he says, let's see if you've learned anything. Put your feet in the water, and then I'll part the sea. God wants us to step out. And when we step out in faith, he'll work miracles for us. Amen? And so trust the Lord. You know, he wants to move mountains for you and part oceans for you, but you've got to step out in faith and give him a chance. He will not work miracles for you unless you do step out in faith. Second part of our answer, what is the oil represent? Then Samuel took the horn of oil, and he anointed him, David, in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David. The Holy Spirit anointed David there. You know, the Bible uses the word anoint. The Greek word is Christos. The Jewish word is Messiah. Christ is the anointed. Hebrew, he's the Messiah. In Greek, he's the Christ, the Christos. He was anointed when he began his ministry with the Holy Spirit. On Pentecost, the disciples were anointed as they began their ministry. When people are baptized, remember Jesus said, unless you're born of the water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. He wants us to be baptized, to be cleansed, committed, our decision, and anointed with the Spirit, his decision. Unless you have the Holy Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. This lesson is talking about the importance of the Holy Spirit and clearing up some very dangerous misconceptions about the gift of the Holy Spirit. Number two, is the Holy Spirit an impersonal force or is he God? You'd be amazed how many people think that the Holy Spirit is the energy of God. Well, the Bible says the Holy Spirit is a person. Notice what it says in Acts chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. You remember when Ananias and Sapphira pretended to give all of their uh, offering to the Lord and they kept some of it? They lied. What did Peter say? Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? And then he went on to say, thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, dropped dead because they lied to God when they lied to the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit God? Yes. yes. Is he just a force or does he have feelings? It says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, we've learned about the seal of God. First of all, what's the mark of the beast? Spirit of the devil. But there's something more than that that's visible, we've learned, right? Obeying the laws of the beast instead of the laws of God will get you the mark of the beast when that day comes, when it's legislated. What is the seal of God? First of all, the Holy Spirit. Everybody who has the seal of God has the Holy Spirit. Do we all understand that? I think that should be very clear. But we've learned that in the law of God, the Sabbath commandment is a special sign or seal or token of his power. Number three, what is the primary work of the Holy Spirit? Well, there's several things the Holy Spirit does, but you can read here in John 16, verse 13. When he, you notice it doesn't say when it, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will 
show you things to come. And then it also says, Jesus said, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Christ said the day may come when his believers will be brought before kings and rulers to defend their faith. He said, do not worry about having your outline in that day. The Holy Spirit will tell you in that hour what you to speak. Number four, what is the one sin that cannot be forgiven? The subject of the Holy Spirit is very important because the Bible says, Matthew 12, 32, but whoever speaks against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. Now, let's talk about this for just a second. What is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? People figure, well, you know, if you can blaspheme the Father and the Son and be forgiven, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit can't be forgiven. That must be the most ugly and abominable sin you could think of. And people have speculated that would be killing your child. That's unforgivable. Oh, well, the Bible says that a man who killed his children named Manasseh was forgiven. It's not murder. Moses murdered. David murdered. It's not adultery. They're all sins. But the Bible tells us that the unpardonable sin is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. What is blasphemy? We've learned blasphemy is taking the prerogatives of God and blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is not becoming angry and shaking your fist at God one day and saying something you'd regret because we've had those moments and some of the prophets even said things in fatigue and discouragement that they regretted, like Jonah and Elijah. Even Job became disheartened. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is resisting the pleading of the Holy Spirit putting yourself in God's place and saying, I'm not going to listen to the voice of the Lord. I'm going to listen to my own voice. I'm going to go my own way. And it's doing it over a period of time so that you sear, you scar, you burn your conscience. You develop a callus on your spiritual ear. You know, when the Holy Spirit first brings conviction, it hurts. And you know what? It's supposed to hurt. I remember when I was in the wood business, selling firewood is seasonal. Everybody waited until it was cold and rainy. They never asked me for wood when it was warm and sunny. And I would then go out. I tried to prepare in advance, but I was always doing a lot more wood cutting in the wintertime, in the mud and the rain. When I first go back into the wood cutting season and I'd pick up my splitting maul and I'd swing an eight-pound splitting maul eight hours a day, my hands would get blisters and they'd hurt and they'd, I'd wrap my hands up, but I'd keep after it. And after a period of time, not the first day or the second, but eventually my hands became thick and hard and I didn't feel it anymore. That's good for wood cutting. It's bad when you're resisting the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit first convicts you that you must obey God and lay aside your besetting sins, it's supposed to hurt. If you continue to resist the pleading of the Spirit, you develop a callus on your spiritual ear. You are turning the volume of God down. You're saying, leave me alone, and it's a very dangerous thing. The unforgivable sin is the sin that God cannot forgive because you've lost the ability to repent. God will always forgive the sin for which you are genuinely repenting. But do you know that repentance is a gift? You can't decide when you're going to repent. There's a lot of people out there that play games with God. They say, well, the thief on the cross, he gave his heart to God on his deathbed, his last hour, and so I'm going to wait until I'm about to die. I'll see if I can calculate that. At the last moment, I'll repent. You can't count on being able to do that. I think Matthew Henry is the one who said, the reason that there's only one example of a deathbed conversion in the Bible is so that none need lose hope, but another reason there's only one example is so that none dare presume. It's very dangerous to say, well, I'll wait and give God my leftovers with my dying breath. You may not be capable of repenting then because it's a gift. It's a gift of conviction from the Holy Spirit. And if you've grieved away the Holy Spirit earlier in your life, you will not be able to recall repentance on your deathbed. And a lot of people do not get a notice in the mail when they're going to die. It happens suddenly. Number five, what are some of the gifts of the Spirit that a person might receive? And keep in mind, not everybody gets the same gift. Some people get several, some people get one, but everybody gets something. Answer, for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. Answer to another, and this is all 1 Corinthians 12, verse 8 to 10, the word of knowledge. To another, faith. These are gifts of the Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, 
diverse kinds of tongues and to another the interpretation of tongues. Now before I go any farther, I'm going to just let you know in advance, we're going to talk a little bit about the gift of tongues in the Bible and the way it's misunderstood. I want you to notice in the Bible, whenever the gifts of the Spirit are listed, such as the list we just read, the gift of tongues is always on the bottom of the list. I'm concerned because a number of churches are turning the list upside down. And they make it sound as though the most important gift is tongues and then everything else follows afterward. That's not biblically honest to do that. Question number six. Which spiritual gift became a subject of controversy in the Corinthian church? I've already given you the answer, but let's read it together. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1 and 2. Desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you might prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. Now, there are a couple of different interpretations for what this unknown tongue is. One classical interpretation was an unknown tongue is a language those present do not understand. But it is a known language somewhere. It's unknown to those present. The other interpretation is the unknown tongue is a heavenly language that nobody on earth understands. Some people speak this language and they don't even know what they're speaking unless they get the gift of interpretation. I respectfully disagree with that. And keep in mind as I'm sharing these things that when I first became a Christian, my infancy was in fellowship with charismatic Christians whom I love and respect and I know many of them will be in the kingdom. Is that clear? But there's a, an article in their doctrine that I have issue with when I go by the Bible. We want to go by the Bible. Amen? Let's find out what the Bible teaches. A lot of these churches, when they get together for their worship services, a person is overcome with the Spirit, they say, and they may begin to speak in these unintelligible utterances. And they call this the gift of tongues. They may not even know what they're saying. It sounds like babbling. Now, what does the Bible say about babbling? Let's look at a couple of references. 1 Timothy 6.20. O oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings. In another place, Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, 16, but shun profane and vain babblings. In the beginning, at the Tower of Babel, when people began to babble, that's where the word comes from, speaking in languages that are not understood is not evidence of God's blessing. It was a sign of God's curse. I will submit to you that when God gave the gift of tongues at Pentecost, the purpose for the gift was to help people understand what was being said, not to create confusion, to clarify the languages, okay? All right, number seven. Let's look at and follow the sequence of what the Lord did here in Pentecost. The Bible tells us in question seven, how did Jesus promise to help his disciples preach the gospel in all the world? Christ had intelligent but basically uneducated followers. The apostles were fishermen, shepherds, tax collectors. And he said, go and preach the gospel in all the world. But most of them only spoke one or two languages. He said, go to preach all the world. Christ said, no problem. I will take care of that. He said, they shall, Mark 16, 17, they shall speak with new tongues. Now, when you say the word tongues in the Bible, that's an old English word for languages. So every time you see the word tongues, just think of language or languages. That's what it means. Uh, we typically don't say, what tongue do you speak? We say, what language do you speak? But that's, how do you say the word tongue in Spanish? Lengua. And that's where the word comes from. So that's what it means. Number eight, what happened when the disciples received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost? Now let me stop before we go to the answer. There are three, how many? Three, three examples in the Bible Three examples of people speaking in tongues in the Bible. It stands to reason to me that if we investigate all three examples, we'll find out what the purpose of that gift is. Does that sound reasonable? Okay, we're not going to build a doctrine on something that's not in the Bible. The first example is Acts chapter 2, then we'll go to Acts chapter 10, then we're going to Acts chapter 19. In those three examples, we will discover what was happening. All right, now in Acts chapter 2, we read in uh, verse 1 and verse 4, it says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay, I'm going to have to use both hands now. The Lord on the day of Pentecost, it's so beautiful the way that the Lord did this. 
There were devout Jews gathered from every nation under heaven in Jerusalem. These were the serious godly Jews who came for the annual feasts. They had come from around the Roman Empire. They spoke many different languages. My mother was Jewish, but she didn't speak Hebrew. She spoke American, which is sort of like English, right? And then, of course, you got another language called New York. <laughs> but the, these Jews who were visiting Jerusalem, many of them did not speak the native language or did not speak it well. They spoke 16 different language groups that are listed there specifically in Acts chapter 2. Now when the Holy Spirit is poured out, God in a miraculous way gave those 120 disciples this supernatural ability to speak in languages they had not formally known or studied for the purpose of preaching the gospel to these visiting Jews that they might be converted and then cause an epidemic of the gospel as they took it back to their respective countries. So the purpose of the gospel was to preach the word. The Bible says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, I will give you my spirit that you might be my witnesses. He never says he gives us the spirit so we can babble. The purpose of the spirit is that we might proclaim and spread the gospel. That's what happened on Pentecost. And you read on and it tells you here in question number 9, what did these foreign Jews who were visiting experience when the Holy Spirit was poured out? It tells us what happened here. It says, they declared, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. They, some of those who were visiting heard the disciples speaking all these different languages. They said, are they drunk? What's all this babbling? It sounded like babbling to them because they didn't know those languages. But the visiting Jews said, I recognize that's my home dialect. I hear them speaking in my native tongue the wonderful works of God. Now, do you think that made a big impression on them? That's why thousands were converted in a day. Because the Bible says tongues are for those who do not believe. It convinced them that God had given them this ability to speak in their languages, not only to speak, but to speak in power about Jesus being the Messiah. And then we know what they said, the wonderful works of God. And then Peter, when he preached the sermon, and they said, what shall we do? That sermon, I expect, was being translated in many tongues. And just like we've got 16 translators are back here that are translating everything I say, there were the 120 disciples gathered out in groups and they were translating what Peter was saying. The wonderful works of God, that Christ the Messiah had come. That was the purpose for the gift of tongues. Is it clear to everybody that in Acts chapter 2, they were speaking in known languages of the world for the purpose of spreading the gospel. Is that clear? Some of my friends in my charismatic churches say, well, Doug, that is one form of the gift, and we're talking about another form. We'll get to that in a minute. Let's just establish what the examples are. Question 10. What happened when Peter preached to Cornelius and his household? It says in Acts 10, 44 and 46, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Now, they were speaking with different languages. You might say, well, Doug, why were they doing that? The Bible says Peter went to Cornelius, who was of the Italian band, and these Roman soldiers, the centurions, they had slaves from all over the Roman Empire. There were several different language groups represented there, obviously. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to communicate the gospel in a supernatural way, languages they had not known before. That's the gift of tongues. Go to question 11. Another example, the last example. What happened when Paul preached to 12 Ephesian disciples? This is in Acts chapter 19. It says, The Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Now, what does the word prophesied mean? Prophecy, one of the words, is to preach. In the New Testament, keep in mind, especially in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, 14, prophecy does not always mean saying, Thus saith the Lord, and foretelling the future. Prophecy means to speak in behalf of another or to preach the gospel for Christ. Okay? With that in mind, these 12 Ephesian disciples, Luke is there, he speaks one language, Paul is there, he speaks other languages, then there's 12 Ephesian believers there. There's several language groups represented. When they were filled with the Spirit and they spoke with tongues, they were prophesying. That means they were preaching. They understood what they were saying. You see what I'm saying? In all three examples, when they got the gift of tongues, they recognized that they were speaking, either magnifying God, the wonderful works of God, or prophesying for God, but they understood what was being said. They weren't just their babbling words over and over again. Now, number 12. What does the Bible say about speaking in a tongue that is not understood by those that are present? 
Uh, you'd think that as much as it's done, that God would endorse it. But what does Paul really say in 1 Corinthians 14? Except you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Now, if that's clear to you, let me hear you say amen. amen. He's, Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians, if you're going to talk, make sure those present understand. The reason this is close to my heart, after I accepted the Lord up in my cave, God was working mightily in my life. Remember, when he found me, I was about as far away from God as a person can get. Running around naked up in the mountains with long hair and a beard, eating out of a garbage can, using drugs, cursing, stealing, lying, living immorally. Then Jesus came into my heart. He helped me stop lying. He helped me give up drugs and drinking. He was making dramatic changes. And I knew his spirit was in my heart. I was hitchhiking from Palm Springs to Los Angeles, Beverly Hills, to visit my mother. On the way, this dignified lady picked me up. It was late at night, and uh, I didn't want to get out on the road, and, and I was amazed she picked me up because I looked pretty dangerous back then. And uh, she said, have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And I thought, well, I'm not sure what she meant by that. I said, well, I think so. She said, I said, you know, God's been helping me overcome sin and, and making so many changes, and he's given me a peace and a joy. She said, no, 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 I'm talking about that. She said, do you speak in tongues? And that kind of caught me off guard. I said, well, no. She said, oh, then you've not received the baptism. And because of the late hour, she said, we're going to have a Bible study. She took me back to her place and opened up her Bible and began to go through these scriptures and tell me how important it was for me to pray that I could speak in this heavenly tongue. And I was really confused. But, you know, it didn't seem right. And I resisted what she was saying. I've got friends who have visited some of these churches. And they say, we want to help you get the gift of tongues. So what you do is you come to the altar and you say, hallelujah. And my friend told me, he went to the altar and he said, hallelujah. And they said, keep saying it. Hallelujah, 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 faster. Hallelujah, 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 faster. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. They said, you've got it. This is the gift of tongues. He said, come on. Now they said, we're priming the spiritual pump. We're helping you loosen your tongue. And they've actually have biblical arguments how this is justified. You know, I have spent a lot of time, and I want to re reiterate, friends, there are a lot of friends of mine in these charismatic churches that practice this, godly, loving, joyful people. As a matter of fact, there are some things we could learn as the traditional Christians from the charismatics about the importance of the Holy Spirit, about the joy of the Lord. There's some things we could learn. But this manifestation of the Holy Spirit and this babbling, I went to one church and I knelt down at a charismatic church and the lady next to me, I could hear her going, Honda Kawasaki Suzuki Yama, Honda Kawasaki Suzuki Yama, Honda Kawasaki Suzuki And I'm going, she's talking about Japanese motorcycles. And then the, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, and then the pastor comes over and he translates the message, thus saith the Lord. And he goes up with this, he says, this is actually a heavenly tongue. It sounds like Japanese motorcycles, but it's another language. Remember, I went to a church another time where whenever the preacher was preaching, halfway through the sermon, his wife would stand up. And she would go, Honda Kalashami, Honda Kalashami, Honda Kalashami, Honda Kalashami. Now, I don't mean to be disrespectful. That's exactly what she said over and over again. Same word, same phrase. Honda Kalashami, Honda Kalashami. And then she'd sit down. He'd say, oh, a message from the Lord. Thus say the Lord. And then he'd go on. He'd give this elaborate message. She might do that for 60 seconds. He'd preach for half an hour on what she had said. And she kept saying the same word. Every week she said the same word. But he had a different message every week. He said, I've got the heavenly understanding. This is the gift of interpretation. And he was interpreting the message. I'm going, wait a second. This is not the gift of tongues. I've got a friend who lived in India. He spoke Tamil, the language there. And for my Indian friends, Anivarakam Malivanakam. That's good evening, everybody. I told you I learned how to say hello in several languages. He went to one of these tent revivals where the pastor was going from individual to individual, translating people as they spoke in tongues. And my friend said, I want to see if this is real. And he went out there, and he began to say something in Tamil over and over again. The pastor came over. He said, oh, this sounds really good. And he said, thus saith the Lord. And he gave this long prophetic message. And my friend said, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, would you please pass the salt? Would you please pass the salt? Would you please pass the salt? And so you have to ask, is this really a heavenly tongue? You know where some of the confusion comes in? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels. They say, this is the tongue of angels. 
Now wait a second. Paul said, though, that means even if. Paul goes on to say, even if I give my body to be burned. He didn't. He was beheaded. He says, even if I have all faith. He did not have all faith. Only God has all faith. Even if I had all knowledge. He did not have all knowledge. He's saying, even if I spoke with the tongues of men and angels and had not love, it would be like sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. Paul never said he spoke with the tongue of angels. He's saying to the Corinthians, you're doing all these tongues and you don't realize if you don't love each other, tongues are a waste. Many people think the fruit of the Spirit is tongues. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is not the gifts of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, Amen. joy, peace. And so many of my charismatic friends, all they want to know is, do you have the gift of the Spirit? And then they go to the bottom of the list, and they say, do you speak in tongues? Something's wrong, friends. And this is not what traditional Christians believe. This is not what Bible Christians believe for 900 years, for 1900 years. This has become popular in many Christian churches just in the last 90 or 100 years. And I want to tell you that you cannot support it biblically. Let's find out more about what the Bible says. Number 13, what was one of the main characteristics of ancient Babylon? It says, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Therefore is the name of it called Babel. That's where the word babbling comes from. At the Tower of Babel, God confounded the languages. At Pentecost, God reversed the curse. He gave them the ability to speak other languages that the church might be one. You see, they were scattered at Babylon because they were making their own religion in defiance to God. At Pentecost, it was not confusion. It was understanding that the Spirit brought. The Bible says God is not the author of confusion. And you walk in some of these churches and it's like a hootenanny. Everybody's babbling and dancing and kicking and the drums are going. And it's just like chaos and bedlam. And they say, this is the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you what, friends. I'll give them credit. Sometimes you go and it's invigorating. I'll give them that. And it's entertaining. I've been to some of these churches and I may not get anything out of the Word, but I don't go to sleep. I've seen people sleeping during my sermons, but boy, some of these churches, you know, folks are falling down and rolling, and, and that's where you get the word holy rollers because this, they used to be fringe churches in North America, and they, the, the mainline churches laughed at them and looked down on them. Now it's all mainline, including Catholic and Protestant. The Catholics have a whole branch that's spreading like wildfire. The charismatic Catholics and charismatic Protestants, it's now in the Baptists and the Methodists and the Presbyterian churches. And it's not biblical. And it's the glue that's going to weld together this final movement, the misunderstanding of the Holy Spirit. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. What's the name on her forehead? Babylon. And what was one of the chief characteristics of ancient Babylon? They babbled at the Tower of Babel. It's a characteristic of fallen Babylon today. It represents confusion. Don't forget, Revelation 16, verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. Three unclean spirits like frogs. Where's a frog's weapon? It's tongue. Nobody's ever been attacked and bitten by a frog. It's the tongues. And the tongues go to all three of these uh, powers, last powers that form a solidarity against God's people. You may say, Doug, where did this come from? How did it migrate into the Christian church? As with all counterfeits, it happens slowly in an insidious, very slow way. Let me give you a little history. Have you heard about the Oracle of Delphi? Anybody here? Look it up in the encyclopedia. Back, way back before the time of Christ in Delphi, Greece, and there's a picture, they had some rocks from which emitted volcanic vapors. A Greek pagan priestess called a Sybil, S-Y-B-I-L, that's where the name comes from, she would go to the vapors and she would inhale them. She would go into a trance and begin muttering and babbling. They called it the language of the gods. The priest would then come along and translate these oracles, these messages from the gods, and they were always very nebulous, vague messages that never could give you any definite guidance. And uh, it was called the Oracle of Delphi. This practice of people going into a trance-like state and babbling and the language of the gods, in voodoo, they have the very same thing. They beat drums, they go into a trance, they speak the language of the spirits, they call it. You have this practice in many pagan religions around the world. 
Well, you know, it migrated into many of the Christian churches back in the late 1890s. And again, at first it was laughed at. But you know, the devil has a way of making counterfeits look genuine. Gradually, the genuine gift of tongues began to be supplemented or overshadowed by the counterfeit. Now, I believe I've received the gift of tongues, the, the real thing. And now, you know, we've got some translators in the back. They've got the gift of tongues, but most of them have learned English in their different languages. I think I got it in a miraculous way. I was driving one day from Demi, New Mexico to uh, California. I was going from Texas to California. In Demi, New Mexico, I'm pulling this old truck, 54 Chevy truck, pulling a big old 20-foot trailer, putting along 45 miles an hour, by myself, bored, radio didn't even work. And I said, Lord, please give me someone to witness to. I always pick up hitchhikers because I used to hitchhike. And you, you breaks up the monotony. You talk to somebody. Right after I prayed, God answered my prayer. There was a gentleman on the side of the road, a Latin gentleman. I stopped and picked him up. He was freezing because it was the middle of winter and all he had on was a dress shirt and jeans. And so I turned on the heat and I said, is that better? And he said, como? <laughs> I said, um, you warm? <laughs> And I turned up the heat and uh, I tried to talk to him and I found out he didn't speak a lick of English. I did learn his name was Omar. The extent of my Spanish was burrito, enchilada, uno, dos, tres. And uh, I thought, Lord, you got a sense of humor. I asked for someone to witness to and he doesn't speak English and I don't really speak Spanish. I took it in elementary school and I flunked. And... Um, I thought, oh, this is going to be interesting. And so as we drove along, I first I thought, Spanish is kind of like English. You just put O at the end of your words. <laughs> and it said, I'm going to drive on my truck -o <laughs> to my to my homo up in <laughs> California. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And then I thought maybe he was hungry. And I said, you want some dinero? <laughs> Meaning dinner. And he said, well, yeah, you know, that's money in Spanish. And uh, then I said, this isn't working. And so I said, Lord, give me the ability to speak his language. I said, I'd like to share the gospel with him. I said, Lord, if ever a person needed the gift of tongues, I need it now. You know, friends, I don't know how it happened or when it happened, but somewhere along the way, gradually, words began to come to me. And I'm not kidding. They just began to come to me. And I began to, to guess. And they were right. I mean, I gave up the, putting the O and the A at the end of everything. Sometimes that worked. It just fell in that way. But I, I began to just guess, and he started understanding. He started talking to me, and I understood what he was saying. He said he was looking for trabajo, for work. And I said, yo vivo en la montaña, arriba, en Norte, California. And, and he's, he's looking at me like, oh, yeah. He said, tu quieres trabajo conmigo? And, and I wasn't perfect, but he understood. He came and lived with me in Northern California, was baptized, and God gave me the ability to speak, and I just got a letter from him a few weeks ago. He's living back in Mexico, and he, the Lord is still working in his life. But uh, from that day to this day, yo no sé cómo predico en español, pero yo comprendo más palabras si tú hablas despacio. Some of you are lento. So the Lord gave me this ability, but why did he do it? He, other people who heard me talking to Omar thought I was babbling, but he understood what I was saying. See what I'm saying? And so the gift of tongues is for the purpose of spreading the gospel. That's the genuine gift. This is what happened to the apostles in the early days of the church. God doesn't keep giving the gift that way when we've got translators available who understand the language. You understand? He does it when there's no other way. It's a supernatural gift, but he still does it. Open your Bibles with me, please. 1 Corinthians 14. There's so much here I want to share, and I'm running out of time. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. This is where most of the information comes on the subject of tongues. Keep in mind, friends, most of what you find in tongues is on one side of one page. It's written by Paul. Paul never mentions tongues in any of his other letters. Peter never mentions it. Matthew never mentions it. Luke never mentions it. Mark, Mark mentions it one time. John never mentions it. Is it appropriate for us to make this the center of our gospel? We should prioritize what God prioritizes. Amen? I remember running into a cult one day that told me I couldn't get to heaven if I shaved. Had to grow a beard. Well, I thought, this is serious. I better check into it. So I studied beards. I'm embarrassed to tell you. 
You know how many times the word beard appears in the New Testament? Zero. So I figured if it wasn't a point of controversy when the Greeks and Romans shaved and the Jews didn't, then it probably wasn't an issue with God. Amen? And so we don't want to build in the wrong place. We should emphasize what the Lord emphasizes. Notice what Paul says here. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14, this is the main area where people are misunderstanding. They say, well, Doug, you're right. This is one part of tongues is to get that gift language. But the other part of tongues is this heavenly prayer language. Have you heard this before? Heavenly prayer language. Because Paul says, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. And I know a lot of people that say, oh, Doug, it's so liberating. I pray in tongues and I feel it. Don't forget that. The emphasis is on the feeling. What does Paul mean here? For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. Paul is not saying that he prays and he doesn't know what he's praying because if you pray and you don't know what you're praying, that's not prayer. You don't know what you're asking for. You're never going to know if you get it. That's not prayer, friends, right? The Bible says God knows what things you ask, what things you need before you even ask him. So this notion that you're praying in a language, you don't know what you're saying, but it feels good and you don't know what you're getting, that's not prayer. Paul is saying, if I pray in an unknown tongue, a tongue that is unknown to those present, I might pray in the Holy Spirit and my understanding is fruitful to me, but it's unfruitful to you. I understand. My spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. The understood subject is to those present. Read the whole chapter. He's talking about not speaking in another language when those present do not understand what you're saying. Baruch Alonoi Eloheinu Motzi Lechem Men I just said a Jewish prayer. I bet not too many of you know what I said. I prayed in the spirit, but it was unfruitful. My prayer in the spirit was unfruitful to you. See what I'm saying? That's all Paul's saying. The Corinthian church was a melting pot of people from all over the world. Their services were becoming a confusing Babylon. Paul was saying, do not speak unless those present understand. I think it's time for us to sing a little song, don't you? Okay, you're going to recognize this. I want you to just join in with me, okay? Come on. You don't recognize it? Really? Is my playing that bad? All right, how about this? You know what it is? I only played a few notes and you recognize it, right? Wait a second. I'm not done yet. I'm going to try and get all of this in I can because it helps you remember. Sing along. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know that one? <laughs> now why am I doing that? Open your Bibles, 1 Corinthians 14. Paul tells us back in Bible times they did not have radios. They communicated in their battles using trumpets. When I went to military school, every morning on the PA we heard, <laughs> that means reveille, get up. The trumpets had signals. Notice here in verse 9, or verse 8, 1 Corinthians 14, for if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who will prepare to the battle? So likewise, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? You're speaking into the air. Friends, if you're going to speak, God wants us to be understood. Is that clear? Yes. The purpose for the gift of languages is to communicate thought. If you're babbling, you are not communicating thought. Where am I? Question 14. I've got to hasten along here. Does the Spirit fill those who deliberately break God's commandments? John 14, 15, what does Jesus say? If you love me, keep my commandments, and I'll pray the Father, and he'll give you another comforter, even the Spirit of truth. Acts 5, 32, what did the disciples say about the importance of receiving the Spirit in obedience? The Holy Ghost, whom God has given to those that obey him. And a lot of these people who have had the Holy Spirit, when they hear the word of God about the Sabbath commandment and they reject it, they may find they're grieving away the Holy Spirit. They had it before because God winked at their ignorance, but now they know. And if they continue to sin willfully after they know the truth, that's very dangerous, friends. 
You know, I think it's interesting that a number of these charismatic ministers that uh, travel around the world and have these mega meetings, they claim they have the gift of tongues, and many of them have been discovered to be disobeying God. It's filled the headlines that some of them were unfaithful to their spouses, they were stealing money, and you know, all the time they were doing that, they were babbling on TV. When they travel overseas, if they've got the gift of tongues, why do they take an army of translators with them? Huh? Number 15, Paul emphasized that we should desire which spiritual gift? 1 Corinthians 14, verse 4 and 5, He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. He that prophesieth, that means preaches, edifies the church. Greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaks in a tongue. 1 Corinthians 14, 12, For as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that you might excel to the edifying of the church. To edify means to build up. Edificio in Spanish. Amen? Number 16. What's the main reason and why does God fill people with his spirit? So they can babble? Acts 1.8. But you'll receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. God gives you power to live the Christian life. That's why it came at uh, baptism. When you commit your life to the Lord, you need that power, amen? Not only to live the life, but to share the life, to be his witnesses. And Acts 4.31, it says, They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. It says nothing about tongues, because this time when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, everyone there understood the language. Don't forget this. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We need to listen to what the Spirit says, right? Number 17, is it possible to tell whether a person, whether or not a person has been filled with the Holy Spirit? How do we tell? Matthew 7, 20, do we tell by the gifts of the Spirit, like tongues, or by the what? Wherefore, wherefore by their fruits shall you know them. So many people say, show me you've got the Spirit by babbling or by tongues. No, Jesus said you show by the fruits. And some people attempt to counterfeit the fruits. You don't make an apple tree an orange tree by taping an orange on an apple tree. You need the fruits in your life. If you want to show me you've got the Holy Spirit, don't babble, love your enemy. Amen? That's evidence that you've got the Holy Spirit. Number 18, how can I receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? How many of you want the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Here's the answer. If you then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those that what? Friends, if ever there was a time when God's people needed God's Spirit, it's now. Would you like to ask God to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit? We're going to have special prayer in just a moment that He'll fill us, that He'll make us empty vessels available for His Spirit. historical tonight that miraculous oil filled the empty vessels are you willing to come to the Lord empty to self say Lord I want you to be I want you to fill me but I know first I must be emptied of my plans and my designs I may not know how I'm gonna follow you but that's how you come to Jesus you come in faith say Lord I recognize I can't live the Christian life without the Christian spirit 
but I trust that your spirit will give me the power to be your witness. Is that your prayer, friends? Father in heaven, here we are. We're coming before you. We pray that you will cleanse us from anything that would fill up our vessels, that would displace the room that's needed for the Holy Spirit. Lord, I would ask that Jesus would wash our vessels in his blood and then just fill us with God, the Holy Spirit. Give us the power to live the Christian life. And I pray, Lord, you'll help us to be your witnesses. Help us to receive the genuine gift of the Holy Spirit, that joy and that peace and that love. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. God bless you, friends. Don't forget, tomorrow morning we have a special presentation dealing with the subject of the unsinkable ship. One of the most important presentations will be tomorrow evening when we talk about living above the crowd, how you can live a victorious life, and it's probably the most important presentation. It's still not too late to bring your friends. God bless you all. Please keep us in your prayers, and you have a good Sabbath. They will see you in the morning.